So the title of my presentation is uh, Metacognition in Non-Lucid Dreaming So Far Exists Without Neural Correlates. So um, uh, well, let me, um, okay. Okay, what are the goals of these presentations? First, I wanna uh, mention what is the importance of metacognition for consciousness, and then I define metacognition. I will also elucidate a little bit controversy regarding metacognition in non-lucid dreaming and origins of present research. And then I will go into my presentation <clears throat> of research and state the implications of results for neurosciences. So I think um, Nolo May, a humanistic psychologist, um, described it, the elegance and sophistication of waking consciousness when he stated the human dilemma is that which arises out of man's capacity to experience himself as both subjects and objects at the same time. The important point is a process of oscillation between the two. So the question is what he is talking about. Individuals are having conscious experiences and are able to think about them. And this process of metacognition indicates the oscillation between the direct experience and its evaluation by the owner of the experience. Now, Fox and Christoph in 2014 defined the metacognition as the ability to reflect upon, comment about, and report variety of mental states with inclusion of metacognitive judgments about perception and performance. And they stated that this might be a state useful for personally relevant and higher order goals. Now, where is the controversy? Fox and Christoph assert that only metacogn that metacognitive evaluations occur only in two states of consciousness. One would be wakefulness, for example, in creative thinking and mindfulness. And the other one is in dr lucid dreaming exclusively and the difference between lucid and non-lucid dreaming state is that lucid dreamers somehow remember that there is a vague world. Non-lucid dreaming dreamers on the continuum remain to be immersed in their st dreaming state. So why not in a lucid dreaming? Fox and Christoph state that interestingly compared to waking rest, non-lucid dreaming typically involves the deactivation of prefrontal cortical regions involved in executive control and metacognitive monitoring, including dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which may explain the lack of meta-awareness during regular dreaming. Now, as a supporting claims, they mention too, the exceptional nature of lucid dreaming serves to prove the role, rule of general lack of control and metacognitive awareness in ordinary dreaming, which is a characteristic likely attributable to deactivation of numerous cortical regions during REM sleep. And the other claim is from 1997 from Brown and his colleagues, REM sleep may constitute a state of generalized brain activity with the specific exclusion of executive systems which normally participate in the highest order analysis and integration of neural information. So where is the controversy? Again, Fox and Christoph reserve metacognitive mental activities only for wakefulness and lucid dreaming. Yet in non-lucid dreaming, dreamers demonstrate reflecting, commenting, and making metacognitive judgments about perceptions and performance. And here is one example phenomenological example. I had a destination in mind where I am going. I knew I had to pass Jay's house. I also knew that on the way, either I could pass through the place, the clinic where Dr. P practiced, or I could avoid it. I decided to go through the place, even though I felt a bit of a fear. I thought, what will I do if I meet him in the hallway? Nevertheless, I decided to go through the clinic. So the origins of this controversy uh, uh, can be found in Freud, Freud's uh, thinking about dreams. Even though he found coherent and reasonable thoughts in dreaming and termed those complicated feats of thinking, he disregarded the findings because acceptance of these findings would contradict his interpretation of dreams with assumption of dreamers regressing to the primary process thinking. And that this uh, 120 years later on, that there is an ubiquitous uh, disregarding and exclusion of non-lucid dreamers' abilities, 
As a most recent example, I would use the two volumes of Dreams, Understanding of Biology, Psychology and Culture, which has over 100 contributors and 28 individual chapters and cognition is missing from both volumes. Previously, Kahan and Laberge posited that sophistication of dream cognition and metacognition could be considered hallmarks of human cognition. So in the present research, I test this hypothesis. Is there any evidence to this claim? So my current research question is, could it be that thought processes of reflecting, commenting, and making metacognitive judgments about one's own perception and performance during non-lucid dreaming are significantly represented in core aggregate of executive skills. So hypothesis is that only in conditions when there is something personally relevant, namely higher order goals, which Fox and Christoph reserved exclusively for wakefulness and lucid dreamings. So only in these personally relevant conditions, the non-lucid dreaming dreamer is capable of using, reflecting, commenting, etc. So in, in other words, I want to uh, restate the hypothesis that there needs to be something personal at stake for the non rusi dreamer to have a use for metacognition. So the way I went about this research was I used 36 different operationalized definitions from Fox and Chap uh, Christoph, chapter titled Metacognitive Facilitation of Spontaneous Thought Processes when metacognition helps the wandering mind find its way. And these are samples of um, these 36 metacognitive variations, commenting about mental state, reaching conclusions, making critical evaluation, decision-making, evaluation of abstract thought, one's own behavior, mental processes, uh, context of cognitive tasks, episodic memory retrieval, evaluation of ideas, thought, utility of ideas, working memory, goal-directed behavior, intentional monitoring, judgment, novel solution, reflective thought, reflecting about mental state and self-regulation. So what is the sample for this current research? And this is a retrospective archival research of 1,288 dreams from dreamers from Argentina, Brazil, England, Japan, Russia, Ukraine, and the United States that during the times 1990 and 2004, Dr. Tripner actually gathered together from the dreamers who were motivated to learn about themselves by working on self-selected dreams. Dreamers were 20 to 70 years old. Males and females from each particular country contributed 100 dreams. American dreams were exceptions because part of them got lost. So in the sample from 1,288 dreams, 979 of them were problem-solving quality. The rest were descriptive dreams. That's how I found out. Descriptive dream contains the description of scenery, the situation, the actions of dreamer or other characters, his or her observation and experiences. And the example would be, I was in a house that was shaped like a heart. We ate dumplings for dinner. Now in a problem solving dream, an independent reader would be able to discern that the dreamer was propelled or prompted to make an active choice in the presence of a situation or even it doesn't matter whether he or she recognized it and explicitly described it or it was implicit situation. In other words, the dream situation affected the dreamer into the personal manner enough to make attempts to seek solution or decide not to use one's own abilities. Now, here is an example of a problem solving dream. I am sitting in a room with my husband. Because I have lost my power of speech, he has to guess what my thoughts are. It is a frustrating and time consuming task. Eventually he gives up and I'm left trying to make a conversation using Scrabble game letter pieces. Now, how did I analyze the data? I used the grounded theory method in which by use of constant comparative analysis of instances of problem solving, I was putting together and generating description of the object of research, which in this case, it was a nocturnal problem solving phenomenon in three modalities, direct self-monitoring and indirect. And in this research, I have used the direct modality, which was uh, thinking. 
And besides deliberate actions and behaviors and use of emotions, I focus in this research specifically on dreamers thinking as they were trying to problem solve their way out. <clears throat> Indirect, <clears throat> uh, let me skip further. I wanna point out that uh, uh, dreaming mind in contrast to the previous statements of authors who neglected the cognition is a cognitively rich dreaming mind. And in the present research, I uh, focused on core aggregate of executive thought processes dreamers use for problem solving with the use of 75 exemplar, exemplary dreams. <clears throat> so these are the exemplary dreams. Core group of eight executive thought processes, analyt analytical, decision-making, defense mechanism, evaluative, goal-oriented, interpretative, motivational, and self-determinative. The numbers in parentheses indicate how many examples are there. So let's, have, let's take an analytical thought process, the dream. I am very worried. I have a heart full of misgivings. I recall that I have to take an entrance examination for the university, but I have not studied for the exam. Because of my work at the newspaper, I am busy every day. I am scared that I may fail the examination. Another example would be decision-making. The leader says that this is a new military and it helps people. The jail building has many flaws in its blue-gray concrete walls. I don't trust the officers and use every trick in the book to get out. Evaluative thought process. This seems to be a radioactive wall and it is coming closer to the house. I snatch my daughter from the crib, but there is no place to take her. And uh, let me go into motivational. My body was uh, put in a coffin and was carried to a cemetery. I felt unhappy being dead and thought, why should I die and let them bury me? And uh, the method, let me go to method with individual 36 different types or definitions of metacognitive processes. I was looking for instances of their occurrence or frequency in eight different types of executive thought processes that I just show you some of them. And all of these were occurring within the immediacy of non-lucid dreams in which the dreamers are generally sensory separated from external world. So the results are as a disclaimer, I have to state that in one exemplary executive thought process, there could be occurring more than one metacognitive process. So the results, most frequent metacognitive evaluations were decision-making, 34 occurrences. After going over the bridge, I realized that I made a wrong turn. The only way to get back on track is to make a wide circle back. The next most frequent metacognition was critical evaluation, 33 times occurrence. It is night. I'm walking back to my dormitory with some of our other girls after a class. Halfway back, I regret my decision, but there was no futon in the school, so I could not have gone to sleep. And in a dormitory, all the girls keep talking and I can't get any sleep. Another one was most frequent was decision-making occurring 33 times. Then I remember that I left something at the school, so I have a good reason to go back. But I decide against it because I don't want to walk back alone. Another one was evaluation of ideas. I find myself in a house where an elderly couple lives, a man and a woman. It stands on a riverbank over which is a natural bridge or embankment. My aim is to cross the bridge and get to the hills on the other side that connect with freedom. It is dangerous to cross the embankment, but it is possible. And another uh, uh, results most frequent would be goal-oriented thought and behaviors, meta-awareness of emotions, judgments of perceptions and judgments of perceptual decision-making. Uh, the least frequent were evaluation of abstract thought his son, a twin, came to me and started talking about a contract. He laid out some terms that were not acceptable to me and I did not want to store my vehicle under those conditions, but I feel stuck. Where else could I store the vehicle? Another less frequent was realization, reflective thought, 
the blood starts spurting from the back of the hand. I shout, let's go to the hospital. Then I let them sue me and repair me. I'm not satisfied with the pace. I hurry him, but we keep going slowly. Commenting on the mental state was another one least frequent occurrence. I am sitting on a wall. I want people to see me to understand my pain. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, another one was evaluation of episodic memory retrieval. Then the wine spills over my body. There is silence in the room. I scream. I realize that the red wine is a Christ blood, but I am a Jew. I scream, I am a Jewess. Uh, least frequent was also evaluation in the context of cognitive tasks. I am with Boris, my boyfriend, who I sleep with, but in a dream there is a strained relationship between the two of us. We are in a nature under the sky and the stars. It should be the perfect setting for making love, but Boris says that he has to go run an errand for his parents. I think it's odd that he has to wait on them at this time of the night. And another least frequent occurrences were metacognition for beneficial outcome, novel conclusions, and interactions between primary awareness and metacognition. No occurrence of the metacognition was regarding evaluation of theories and redirection. So overarching results from you by using these 36 different aspects of metacognitive processes, these occurred for 108 times in 75 exemplified executive thought processes. On average, one core example of executive thought processes contains about almost six metacognitive thoughts. So in discussion, non-lucid dreamers, indeed really upon realizing there is something personal at stake within executive thought processes, uh, are able to use metacognition for dealing with the situation. And the limitation of this uh, research is, uh, I don't know yet whether the frequency of metacognitive evaluations occurs in all other five parts of nocturnal problem solving phenomenon. Uh, it is unknown to me yet. Now, what is the significance of these findings for neurosciences? Current phenomenological findings about frequency of occurrence of met metacognitive reflecting, commenting, and evaluating during non-lucid dreamers problem solving efforts contradict the current or in quotation marks earlier neuroimaging findings from 24, 25 years ago. Examples would be Brown and his colleagues and Market and his colleagues. These studies are often cited in the hundreds of sites, but they are 24, 25 years old. Ioannidis and his group of colleagues argued that crucial dorsal areas like dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex were outside of the field of view of early PET scanners. But we don't know, we don't have any new neuroimaging studies of sleep. Uh, current theorizing about putative neural correlates of metacognition relies heavily on isomorphic hypothesis, which states Dreaming in both its general form and its specific content is totally determined by physiological processes, which is a statement by Stigold in 2000. Now in conclusion, since interpretation of earlier neuroimaging studies insist on deactivation of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as an evidence of non-existence of sophisticated range of mental processes, I propose that non-lucid dreamers metacognitive evaluation as part of their executive skill repertoire does not depend on neural correlates. The metacognitive processes as they exist as feature of non-lucid dreaming consciousness could be thus currently thought about as independent of neural correlates and thus may represent a transcending function of consciousness which exists during non-lucid dreaming without sensory connectedness with external world. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Do we have any questions? We have a few minutes. Um, the question is, did I notice any difference in dreaming based on age or gender? I wasn't focusing on that because 
the grounded theory method that I used uh, does not rely on any uh, age or gender differences. Um, uh, uh, there is a question. Jeffrey, can you read the question? I don't know what the last question was. Uh, absolutely. Um, how did you conclude that it was not linked to neuroprocesses? Well, how? Because the, uh, all the studies, which are the older studies in neuroimaging, actually focus on deactivation as an evidence of uh, the processes not occurring. So I went the other way. I said, if we don't have any evidence that the processes are not occurring and phenomenological evidence indicates otherwise, then we cannot rely on these kind of neuroimaging findings. And therefore, we cannot support the isometric, uh, isomorphic hypothesis at this current state. 